About 21 years ago, I went to Guatemala on a business trip. While I was waiting for the airplane, I went downtown in Guatemala City and went to a few antique shops and found some very interesting art and old Maya Indian pottery dating back before 900 AD. I bought some of these pieces and brought them home. Fulling's hoard of Mayan pottery turned into one of the finest collections in America. Then, improved relations between the USA and some Central American states outlawed the export of antiquities. Collecting them became illegal, and Fulling's treasures were sold off to the Boston Museum. Then I had nothing to collect anymore. Once you get this disease as a collector and an art connoisseur, you have to do something. So I had purchased a painting some 20 years ago in Haiti, and I've always enjoyed it. So I went to Haiti and I started looking at paintings. First port of call, a tiny corner of Haiti. It belongs exclusively to the cruise line, so it's yours for the day. Paradise here. Everything from passengers to pina coladas are brought ashore by tender. Say goodbye to it all. The islanders move in to sell their wares. And some beautiful, naive paintings. These come at a price, but I feel they're worth every dollar. And all this provides a bit of local color for those who want to stay pale and interesting. The discovery of Haiti as a tourist attraction had been made some years earlier. The idea of the exotic in the 1940 was very strong. People looked to the Caribbean as the exotic place uh, in the world. Cuba was turned into a playground, so was Haiti. It was fashionable to be sitting by the swimming pool in one of these lush hotels and to hear in the background the drumbeat of some kind of low ceremony, you know, as if the natives were getting restless. Voodoo isn't just a bait for the tourist. It's part of the very foundation of Haitian society. From the battles for independence two centuries ago to more recent dictatorships, the religion has been a powerful symbol of identity. Duvalier himself took the nickname Baron Samedi, a figure from nightmares. Artists such as Hector Hippolyte saw their work as an integral part of their religion. They'd been discovered in the 1940s. Collector and writer Selden Rodman was there at the beginning. I went to Haiti for the first time in 1937 or 38 on a tramp steamer. Andre Breton and Wilfred Olam came to Haiti in 1945 and uh, took some of Hippolyte's pictures to Paris and that spread the word that something was going on in Haiti that Frenchmen better take a look at. By 1949, when the movement was in full sway and the pictures had been shown in California and in Europe, I decided that it was important for the artists to have some of their most important works remaining in Haiti. And I had the idea of their decorating the cathedral with murals. They put the sketches on the wall in charcoal, and once they were approved, which was almost automatic, they went ahead and did the painting. Then other artists came in and painted scenes in the transepts, including a huge mural, The Miracle at Cana by Wilson Vigo. We did them in egg tempera because fresco, we decided, was too complicated a process. And the only problem was to keep the eggs from being eaten, so we had to have a padlock on the refrigerator for the eggs. All of the artists have been good practicing Catholics and people who went to Buddhist ceremonies from their birth in the childhood. Many of those artists, like Hippolyte himself, who is a Buddhist priest, have engaged in this kind of activity. The Haitian Voodoo temples or Humphors have painted altars and backgrounds to the altars, so that there's been a syncretism of Christian and Voodoo in Haitian art right from the start. The paintings that were on the walls in the Home Four were uh, human representations of the spirit, very much influenced by 
the Christian iconography. St. Patrick is Dambala, the Virgin is Ezeli, and so on. So when they were taken down from the walls onto canvases to be sold, they've lost their sacred aspect and became profane. And the buyers of these works, not knowing these symbols, could never understand them. So they looked at them very superficially and saw them as colorful and joyful. It is colorful indeed, but it's religious art. I saw a painting published in books called The Pantheon of Voodoo. So I went to Andre Pierre and I said, Andre, you painted a painting many years ago that was seven feet long, The Pantheon of Voodoo. And I said, well, I would like you to make me the same painting except eight feet long. I don't care how long it takes, I have to have the painting. And here it is. And it really gives me tremendous pleasure just to sit down and, and see what is going on with all the loas and spirits. It's absolutely fantastic. Now we want to go one step further. Now the one step further that has to be one of the finest and largest paintings that Andre Pierre has ever done. And he said when he started it that I hope I live long enough to be able to complete this. In a little village outside Port-au-Prince, Fulling's American dollars are used by the artist to support a community of 35 people and their livestock, the congregation of voodoo priest Andre Pierre. We always have a magnum of wine between us. It's sort of a ritual. So we communicate after the bottle of wine very well. And to the master. <laughs> and a very good friend. Andre Pierre has acquired a big reputation among collectors in Europe and other places. Largely, but not entirely, because of publicity that I've given him in various books and catalogs. And yet, when I went to visit him and asked him if he would take me to see some of the early murals that he'd done, he turned to me and said, what have you ever done for me? And I said to him, uh, Andre, have you ever heard of Vincent van Gogh? Knowing perfectly well that he hadn't. And he said, no. And I said, well, he was an artist whom nobody publicized during his lifetime. As a result, he sold one picture for a dollar. He sold, he got some money for his painting while he's still alive. Yeah. Well, he got a head start over Van Gogh. Right. He's, he's got a head of, of Van Gogh. <laughs> <laughs> Parce Oh, 
Bogu. Alors, si on ne peut pas gagner de drapeau, c'est un fort nul. Et puis, le gain de drapeau, c'est un ton fort qui est membré, qui a capacité. We do very well with the voodoo banners, the flags, that are very popular, very colorful. People buy them for different reasons and uh, some of them make pillows out of them, and people uh, frame them, and people just collect them. We are at the Design Center of the Americas at Denia in Florida, and we are at the Gallery Marasa, that is a Haitian art gallery here in Florida. The building is not open to the general public. It's a professional building for uh, the interior designer. And um, they bring in their clients for the purpose of shopping and decorate their home. We sell a lot of the nudes that we have for the bedrooms. And we sell the fruits and flowers, uh, of course, for the kitchen and dining area. Of course, Haiti has to respond to its customers' enthusiasm for the decorative. It brings in dollars to one of the poorest countries in the world. But what happens to the artists who don't work for the big collectors or the tourist train? We started five years ago to, to present Haitian art abroad and to do lectures on Haitian art abroad in order to change uh, an idea that had been presented some 40 years back, that Haitian art equals naive or primitive art. They were the trained artists, but they were totally discarded because uh, not being primitive, they were not Haitian. They were judged not authentic. Patrick Villers is Haiti's most internationally successful artist. He's had major exhibitions in Paris and Washington. J'ai quand même étudié l'histoire et les trônes, l'histoire du pouvoir à travers la culture européenne et à travers la culture africaine. Mais comme je travaille sur ce qui est fondamentalement dans le concept vaudou haïtien, j'ai trouvé un langage universel mondial. Les impressionnistes ont eu une base littéraire et les grands courants de l'art anglais ont eu leur base littéraire. Mais ici, la base de la peinture qui a fait le mouvement de la peinture naïve, elle a eu comme base une littérature essentiellement qui était une vision de, de étrangère à la culture haïtienne. Les Américains sont venus, ils ont développé l'art naïf, et puis toute la littérature de cet art naïf-là, elle est américaine en grande partie. Bon, la commercialisation a fait développer le, 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 le mouvement pictural haïtien, mais en même temps, il a freiné beaucoup de choses, parce qu'il a permis une répétition des œuvres, il a permis un affaiblissement aussi des œuvres. Beaucoup d'artistes, de, 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 Sont, sont devenus des, des, des artisans de leur propre création. On sent que c'est une répétition du beau, ce n'est pas une, euh, une recherche de l'expression, c'est plutôt une recherche de faire une chose jolie pour vendre rapidement. We actually maintain a presence in the whole world with our paintings. There are also uh, actually privileges which we grant at the tourist office for all gallery owners all painters who like to exhibit, we do help them for their traveling expenses, for uh, their exhibits all over the world, from Japan to Europe and from Europe to the United States. Haiti has been on the spot politically, which means that our image as a you know, tourist destination has been very hard to sell. I don't feel that there's one single item in the Caribbean that has 
so much cultural potential, so much such a strong history, such an identity to sell uh, this country of Haiti. I'm positive.